running product and developer relations for Angular. And today I'm going to share what we're actually going to release next week, most likely on Wednesday. <laughs> we are going to release Angular version 15, which is going to include quite a few features. And um, I'd like to share with you most of them today. So usually when we talk about Angular, we discuss three main sub-products. We have the framework that is used for development of components, directives, pipe services. We have dependency injection, pretty opinionated set of primitives there. We often count the router and forms modules in the same category. We have also tooling. The tooling is the Angular CLI, Angular language service and dev tools, and components with our material design implementation for Angular and also the Angular CDK component development kit. Even though we are focused on about three sub products and we're about 25 people on the team, we're part of a way larger organization of Google. And as we know, Google is one of the driving forces in the web space by building Chrome. We're advancing quickly in machine learning and we're trying to find collaborations across different teams so that we can support developers in developing web applications with confidence. So first I'd like to start with a couple of partnerships that led to development of exciting features. And the first one I'd like to talk about is actually related to JavaScript fatigue and how we are working towards having less of it in the Angular community. So if you look on GitHub, you're going to see that we have quite a few checks as part of our CI, about 26 to 28 checks. We're checking from everything from cold size regressions to like unit tests, end-to-end -end tests, and way more. Where there is a really good quote by Dijkstra saying that program testing can be a very effective way to show the presence of bugs, but it is hopelessly inadequate for showing their absence. And that's very true. Even if we have 100% test coverage, we might not be able to test all the different edge cases of different variations, let's say of states and like cold execution, like program execution to find some bugs. Luckily though, the way we develop Angular supports us to test way more use cases than what is covered in our tests. We developed the framework on GitHub and it is used inside of Google. Google uses something called a monorepo where we host like literally billions of lines of code. And there are a couple of thousands of clients, uh, there are a couple of thousands of applications actually that are, that are uh, dependent on Angular. Some of them are a couple of thousands of lines of code. Some of them are like 14, 15 million lines of code. For instance, the Google Cloud Council. Every time when we push code to GitHub, we synchronize it with the internal version of Angular within the monorepo. And we run the test for all the affected applications. So, you can see this check right here. This helps us to test with way more different use cases than we have even thought about and guarantees high level of stability. However, in order to ship sometimes changes, we have to implement automated code migrations so that we can move from a deprecated API to a newer version. This is what we integrated as part of our ng update experience. So just next week, make sure you take advantage of ng update to migrate to Angular version 15. So this is on infrastructural level, how Google is generally supporting the development of Angular. Now I would like to focus on a couple of partnerships where we developed features that enable us to make the Angular developer experience better or improve the applications, the performance of the applications that you're developing with the framework. The first one that I would like to talk about is the partnership with Chrome. You know that Chrome has the goal to make the web platform successful, and uh, they are doing that by enabling developers to build high quality applications to provide good user experience for the end users. As part of this initiative, they developed a set of user centric metrics called Core Web Vitals. With Core Web Vitals, we put a number on the user experience that users face by interacting with an application. One of the core initiatives in Chrome is called Aurora. Aurora is supporting web frameworks, Angular, including Next.js, Nuxt, and others, in order to deliver better core web viral metrics. We have been collaborating with Aurora for a bit, 
And some of the improvements that we did in the framework so far together is around critical resource inlining. For instance, inlining of critical CSS and also fonts. We'll be ramping up our partnership in 2023 on another level though. We'll be investing further in improvements in our server-side rendering pipeline. But something that is going to be primarily part of the version 15 release is our image directive that is optimized for Core Web Vitals. I'm sure you have a lot of images in your applications. And in order to apply the image directive to all of them, because of the Angular's like, templating system, you don't need to do too many changes. You don't have to import any components or directives from other packages. You just need to import your directive once and apply it to your app module. From there, you can opt in into using it for your images. All you need to do is just update the SRC attribute, attributes to ng SRC, and the image directive is already going to start proposing improvements. For instance, if you have unspecified dimensions, it is going to suggest that you may want to specify them to reduce cumulative layout shift regressions. It is going to propose you to add pre-connects and many other optimizations. One of the partners of Angular using the image directive observes already about 75% improvement in their largest contentful paint by using the image directive. And in version 15, we're going to make it stable. We're also adding two more features in the stable release. We're going to automatically generate SRC set so that you can require appropriately sized images to reduce the download size. And, well, specifying width and height is not always what we love to do. And sometimes we can't even do it. The size of an image depends on the parent container, for example. That is why we're experimenting with a fill mode feature that allows your image to stretch based on the size of your parent container. And from there, still, we guarantee that you're not regressing in terms of cumulative doubt shift and other core web values metrics. I mentioned server-side rendering. Well, the, the improvements that we're going to do in server-side rendering in 2023 are primarily related to updating our destructive hydration algorithm to a proper hydration, where we'll be reusing uh, the DOM structure that is built by the server rather than re-rendering from scratch. However, we also see that the hydration or the client-to-server transitions in front-end frameworks, they're evolving really fast. In Google, we have been using the concept of resumability, for example, for close to 10 years now, and would like to experiment this in Angular as well, because we see that with frameworks such as Quick, it is getting traction externally as well. We see partial hydration getting traction too, and we would like to see what would be the evolution of all these solutions in the JavaScript community and pick the best one that fits the Angular, uh, Angular goals and design. So in 2023, we're probably going to come up with a more advanced hydration strategy that we're going to share with the community, but you should be definitely expecting non-destructive hydration first. Paul also mentioned ES Build. Well, we're doing some experiments with ES Build. Now, when you run ng Build in Angular, we're going to use Webpack, we're going to bundle everything together, pass it, in fact, to ES Build, and finally to Terser to produce the optimal output. In conversations with Evan Yu from Veet and Vue and uh, just broader look at the JavaScript community though, we decided to replace the, this whole complicated build pipeline with only ESBuild so that we can produce your final output. It has its own trade-offs, but we observed currently that the, the speed of the code builds is about 57% faster which is, I mean, a significant improvement, especially if you don't have the opportunity to apply this caching in your CI pipeline. In this case, ESBuild is going to produce optimal results for you. This feature has been available as experimental in version 14 projects. So in order to give it a try, just update your Angular.json and replace uh, the current browser builder with the browser ESBuild builder. What is new in version 15 is the watch mode. So now you'll be able to specify ng build dash dash watch, which will allow you to make changes in your application and get incremental, uh, incremental builds. All right, we discussed how Angular is kind of like a batteries included or 
you start with best practices from the beginning. And this is still the case. However, we noticed that in the past, we happen to start developing all the tools that you may need as part of your development flow. We clearly have the CLI and we have a framework. And Angular is a good way to build web applications. However, we also started building tools for end-to-end -end testing, for unit testing, such as Protractor and Karma. We built linters. For instance, I built a linter before I joined Google it, and uh, it ended up being part of the Angular CLI, Colalizer. Now, we would really not want to be in the business of testing or static analysis when we don't have to be. We're good in delivering tools for building web applications, so that's what we want to focus on. That's why we're going through a new strategy where we would like to meet developers where they are. While we still encourage you to follow best practices with ng-test and ng-e2e for end-to-end -end tests, we would like to enable you to pick the tools that you want. For instance, you're now able to use Cypress, Nightwatch, or WebDriver.io when running end-to-end -end tests. Next year, we will be investing to do the same for ng-test. So we were working with testing vendors to select the best tools for the job. And part of the reason why we decided to go this way is because of our developer satisfaction survey, which we're really grateful to all developers for engaging with it. We have about 20 to 25,000 responses. And to my knowledge, this is the, the biggest front-end survey out there, which allows us to gather a lot of very useful insights. Looking at the developer survey over the past few years, we noticed that debugging is a pretty challenging topic for most developers. So we decided to implement some improvements there. Looking at the open-ended answers further, we saw that people struggle with error messages, and we did some improvements in error messages. We visited all error messages, developed guides, and also video tutorials so that you know how to fix the most common errors. We also worked on change detection improvements, and now we will be exploring more dependency injection debugging tooling. With change detection, you can already use Angular DevTools. So you just install the extension, go to Chrome DevTools, open the Angular tab, start profiling, and you'll be able to preview the individual change detection cycles. With dependency injection, though, we would like to allow you to preview the component dependencies in your application. We would like to enable you to preview what are the dependencies of your components' dependencies and where all these dependencies are coming from. So in a developer preview, you will be able to take advantage of this functionality. We expanded the functionality of Angular DevTools in a way where we can preview the dependencies of our components and where they are coming from, and also provide you a more holistic view of your entire dependency injection hierarchy, where you can preview the individual injectors, their relationship between another, one another, and the providers declared inside of them. As I mentioned, this in a developer preview, but you can already give it a try by heading to the link at the bottom right of the slide. All right, so this is available as an experimental feature. Let me share something with you that we shipped, that we're going to ship actually next week as part of Angular version 15. There was a lot of confusion around error messages, right? And even though we made some, some improvements on the error messages, that was just part of the story. They're part of a bigger story called stack traces. And stack traces, when it comes down to web frameworks, they have not been too great over the past, I mean, forever. <laughs> so we got in touch with Chrome DevTools, and we wanted to come up with solutions that would allow us to improve stack traces for Angular, but that would be also applicable for other technologies out there, for other front-end frameworks. So we pretty much wanted to improve stack traces for everyone. Let me show you what we did and the before and after. This is a very simple Angular component where we just have a submit button with like a submit method here, async submit method. We set loading flag to true, send a request, and set the loading flag to false. Currently, if you get an error in this component, your stack trace is going to look like something like this. How do you even understand what happened in your application? You just see a single call frame 
coming from the app component and everything else is coming from either zone.js, the Angular runtime, or rxjs. So we did a few iterations. First of all, we changed the Angular CLI to update source maps of scripts coming from node modules and instrument Chrome DevTools to ignore call frames coming from node modules to make the stack trace relevant. After that, Chrome DevTools developed a new API in partnership with us called the async stack tagging API that allows us to stitch different asynchronous stack traces, for example, from micro or macro tasks together into a more complete overview of what is going on in your application. For instance, you can see that the user pressed a button here associated with the listener. After that, we called submit, we called the request, called fetch, and finally something happened in our app component. And finally, we will be collaborating in the future with the TypeScript team to improve stack traces further by changing source maps for generated calls that is coming from templates so that stack traces are also friendly. This is already a significant improvement having a readable stack trace. But what I love the best about this feature is that it works out of the box with Chrome DevTools. So when you're stepping into a function, you're not going to go into zone.js or rxjs or Angular's runtime at all. This is going to be available next week in version 15. So make sure you run ng update. Another partnership that allowed us to ship improvements in the components part of Angular is with the Material Design team. Material, they are developing the specification for Material Design and also maintaining a set of primitives that implements this specification. So for a while, we have been building our own components and Material have been having their own primitives and we had to try to keep up with the changes in their styles. With our MDC web effort, we would like to reuse the styles coming from Material Design so we had to adjust the structure, the DOM structure of our components to match the selectors of MDC. This took us some time, as you can imagine, but in version 15, this is now stable. So you'll be able to use the material design components based on MDC primitives. In order to update and take advantage of this feature, you just need to go to your application, update to version 15, and run the following migration, just ng-generate Angular material MDC migration. If you're depending on mgdeep to specify styles and override styles of material, keep in mind that this may break your overrides. And also, if you're using tests, if you're writing tests, make sure you use the Angular test harnesses, since the DOM structure of our component has changed. Another feature in version 15 is the range input of Angular material. This has been the fourth more requ most requested feature in the Angular Components repository, and well, it's going to be part of the release next week. Now I would like to spend some more time talking about more fundamental changes that we're planning and working on in Angular, and some of them are, they, they are going to land next week in version 15. We are aware that Angular sometimes could be overwhelming for beginners. So we have been re revisiting the individual concepts one by one and trying to figure out whether they're essential for the framework or not. I'll recommend you to check this talk by Alex and Jeremy from ng-conf, which should be on YouTube anytime now. But in general, we agree that core for Angular are best practices. We would like to enable people to scale their applications. You can start with a hobby project and you should be able to incrementally adopt best practices so that you can scale your application to like hundreds of thousands of lines of code. Also, we would like to provide the tools you need to build high quality apps. That's why we're partnering with Cypress and with folks from the community on tools for static analysis and end-to-end -end testing. Stability and security are also critical and also the community. So we were thinking, are ng modules really Angular? Are they critical? Are they a critical part of Angular? I have a personal story with ng modules. So I, in fact, wrote a book about Angular before I joined Google. And the publishing house said, let's publish the book right now. It's Angular version 2 RC4. So let's just publish your book so it is, we release it before Angular is stable. And Angular is already on RC, so nothing should break, really. So I said, sure, yeah, let's do that. And well, Angular broke. The next RC, we introduced ng-modules. 
And uh, my book got outdated about like a couple of days after we released it. So one of the first things I did when I joined the team was to make ng modules optional. <laughs> and back then we were rewriting Angular with Ivy. As you can imagine, well, we couldn't merge this pull request that easily. But finally, in version 15, we made them optional through the new standalone component APIs for standalone directives and pipes as well. Pretty much that's a 30-second overview of how standalone components work. Rather than having to have an ng module to declare what directives, pipes, and components should be available in the context of your template, you specify them in an imports array that is part of the component metadata. This feature enabled a lot of other features. For example, the currently the most popular feature request in the Angular framework repository is the ability to add directives to host elements in components. We were only able to ship this feature because of the new standalone directives API, which makes directives self-contained. Let me show you what this feature is and how we actually made it, in my opinion, way more powerful compared to the original request. We kind of introduced a new paradigm for call to use in component models. So here is the Angular Matte menu, which has a selector Matte menu. So we are using it in the template as, well, with its element selector, element uh, that is matching the selector of Matte menu. What we would like to do is enhance Matte menu by adding directives to the host element, to the already rendered component. There was no easy way to do that. Some people were resolving this by using inheritance. Sometimes inheritance is not a bad idea. In this case, math menu really extends CDK menu, and this makes sense. It is a proper is a relationship. So it's really uh, math menu is a more specific implementation of the CDK menu. However, if you would like to add has cover directive, you'd have to use multiple inheritance, and well, TypeScript doesn't support this, probably for the better. What we did was to come up with a new kind of paradigm for call to use that is kind of a mixture between inheritance and traits or uh, mixins, where you can specify the directives that you're using within your component metadata. And compile time will be able to select the proper inputs from each one of your directives so that you can use in your math menu here only the inputs that actually make sense in the context of your component. This is already available in our RCs and it will be stable in version 15 next week. Standalone components also allowed us to make improvements in the router as well. Probably, you know, if you have to declare a route right now, you often need the routing module and it's just a lot of boilerplate that were so unnecessary. What standalone components enable us to do now, or optional ng modules, is just declare your routes as this simple array where you have your path, load, children, which is for lazy loaded module, and you just return the routes from this lazy loaded module. You can make this even simpler if you have a default export. The lazy loaded module is just an array of components. Of, uh, of route declarations, excuse me, where you're rendering the lazy component. And the way you stitch everything together is in the bootstrap application call where you provide the providers with provide router, uh, where you provide the routes with provide router specifying as first argument the route. And that's it. This is going to be also available in version 15 next week. But another improvement in the router that I'm even more excited about is around guards and resolvers. This is a traditional way to define a guard, which defines whether the user of your application will be able to open, in this case, the user, user ID uh, page. This is by adding this injectable locked in guard, where we're injecting the login service and in can activate, we're checking whether a user is logged on or not. With version 15, we're introducing functional guards that use the new inject function for dependency injection, which allows us to make the route declaration, the declaration way simpler. 
Here, you just need to inject the login service and check whether your user is logged in, and that's all. As I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, now we're looking into, is Zone.js Angular? Do we need to have Zone.js in order to enable people to develop, to be productive with Angular? Of course, we don't want to break existing applications, so Zone.js is going to continue existing. But what we can do and what we can add on top of that so that we can speed up Angular, since Angular change detection is really fast, just Zone.js sometimes involves it more frequently than required, and also to make it more local. So revisiting change detection. We're looking into what actually triggers change detection. Currently, all the asynchronous tasks, pretty much anything that any, at any moment when we assume that something might have changed in your app, we're running change detection over the entire component tree. This is a little bit redundant. We're also revisiting how do we detect for changes. Are we going to run in the entire change detection in the entire component subtree, component tree, or, or only in a couple of components? As I mentioned, the actual change detection is fast. We are compiling templates to effective, to very fast JavaScript instructions, but the scope of the change detection has been suboptimal for sure. Pavel and Alex from my team, they have been doing experiments. And one of the experiments that Pavel did, for instance, is using signals from Preact in an Angular application. So this just this doesn't mean that we're going to go with Preact signals. They're great. This, they might just be not fitting the Angular's, uh, might not be the ideal fit for Angular itself. But this is something that we're just exploring the space of uh, reactivity with signals and uh, variety of different ways to trigger change detection and perform detect for changes in components, uh, components that are part of uh, your component tree rather than the entire component tree globally. Other questions that we have been looking into. Are templates Angular? Can we do something to simplify the Angular component declaration? Are classes Angular? Should we always use classes for declaration of Angular components? These are questions that we haven't answered to ourselves just yet. And we'll really value the opinion of all the Angular developers out there, or pretty much all the participants in the JavaScript community, so that we can decide where we should head in 2024. If you're interested in following further what is going on in the Angular world, I would recommend you to check our roadmap at angular.io slash guide slash roadmap. We're updating it about twice a year or so, and it is up to date since as of uh, November 5th. Also, we're publishing a lot of resources on YouTube and Twitter. So if you want to stay up to date with the latest advancements and individual features, make sure you check our social channels. That's mostly what I had for you today. As a recap, I will just want to reiterate on the main focus that Angular has. We really want to enable developers to be on the performance path by default. This is the reason for us looking into improving the server-side rendering experience and the reactivity model. This also has an impact on the developer experience, which is core part of our priorities as well. And also at the same time, we'd like to meet developers where they are and leverage the tooling ecosystem. That's all I had for you today as part of this presentation and would love to answer the questions you have for me.